I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Dr. Reginald Ray. Reggie is the co-founder and spiritual director of the Dharma Ocean Foundation, dedicated to the evolution and flowering of the somatic teachings of Tibetan Buddhism. He was also a university professor at Naropa University. He is the author of many books, including Buddhist Saints in India, Entering the Vajra World, and Somatic Descent, as well as audiobooks, including Your Breathing Body and Mahamudra for the Modern World. So I want to begin with a compassionate statement from your book, Somatic Descent. Mm. And you have this definition of Tantra where you say that Tantra means continuity and indicates that each moment of life is a step on the journey. No matter how it may seem, there are actually no sidetracks and no regressions. Mm -hmm. And can you elaborate on this bit of no sidetracks and no regressions? Because I think many of us spend our life feeling like we're sidetracking or we're going backwards, and it actually creates a lot of suffering. Well, you know, the Vajrayana standpoint is quite different from ordinary spirituality, as you may know. And ordinary spirituality, and that includes Buddhism also, we begin with kind of a problematic situation. And we, particularly in modern culture, we have a lot of tools now, a lot of very wonderful, intelligent approaches to human suffering. And we begin to work away on our problems. And we begin to kind of peel them off and resolve them. And we go deeper and we resolve our traumas. <clears throat> The Vajrayana viewpoint is very interesting. It's really quite different from this. I would typify that approach as working from the outside in. In the Vajrayana approach, we begin actually with who we are. And more than that, we begin with a part of ourself that most of us have zero knowledge of and zero connection with, which is what we call our deeper self, our fundamental nature, our, you know, our essence as a human being. And the thing about the Vajrayana is it's a practice tradition, meaning that theory basically, while it's helpful, it doesn't actually really change anything. This is the Vajrayana standpoint. And you need, if anybody's going to sit here and talk about spirituality, to us, we need a direct experience of what they're talking about. So when I talk about connecting with our <clears throat> essential nature, we begin in this tradition with an experience of a part of ourself that is actually the foundation of our person and our personality. And we need to make contact with it. We need to experience it. And we need to amazingly enough, realize that at the foundation of our personality right now at this moment is a part of ourselves that is actually completely open and boundless and free. And we need that experience right up front. And then what happens is the whole path is becoming more acquainted with this re really truly infinite part of ourselves and beginning to realize that that's actually who we are and that all of the ups and downs of life don't compromise that we're already free we're already fulfilled as people i mean it's an outrageous point of view absolutely but what happens is then we come back to our problems and we find something very, very different from what we thought. Our problems actually become expressions of our own deepest nature and our freedom. And they become points of connection with other people. When you 
experience the basic state or fundamental nature of yourself, it kind of solves all your problems. In other words, you're not looking for fulfillment anymore because you see it's already there and you can you know it, you feel it. Then your so-called problems become opportunities to connect with other people. And I'll give you an example. I have a, a very good friend you may know you may have heard of named Fleet Mall. And uh, he was a student at Trump Rinpoche, as I was in the in the 70s. And he was he was arrested on you know, he was flying drugs back and forth between Mexico and the United States. And, you know, it was like, it was a lark from a certain point of view. Everybody was playing and, you know, and uh, got arrested and he was put in prison. And for him, he took this approach and prison became for him an incredible opportunity for his own development and for the development of other people. And he, and he founded really, really important prison work, bringing the, the Dharma, bringing this tradition into prisons. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like just a, a turning our whole way of looking at things upside down. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And you also have this line someplace, it might be in your book, Entering the Vajra World, where you talk about how we need something genuine to continue. And I'm wondering if that connects with what you're sharing right now. Like there's a piece for, for Tantra to work, we need this piece of, of being genuine. And I'm wondering in that context, what that, what that word means. Genuine is, I think in, in all spiritual traditions, it's probably one of the most important qualities and in, in the way we define it is being genuine means being yourself and being naked, being unprotected and being willing to have others see you as you are, as you truly are. And that includes, you know, I mean, we feel of course shaky and we're afraid you know, we're going to be too vulnerable and there, there are a lot of reasons that we hide and we're fake. But you have to begin really on the spiritual path by willingness to sort of disclose who you are, you know, to let the universe see you. Because the, the strange thing, you know, there's a, a song by a group that I used to like a lot, the Dixie Chicks. And the song is Everybody Knows. And it's, it's you know, the song is basically about what we're going through, people actually know it. They can see it. And we're the ones that are think we're hiding. And we're not really hiding anyway. So it's kind of, you know, just being willing to be exposed and being vulnerable. And over time, you discover, once you let go of having to fake it, you know, fake and, and try to be somebody you're not, there's unbelievable power in that and also freedom. And you can connect with people because people know when you're, you know, you're not, you know, being genuine with them. Yeah, it's very true. It's it's a fine line though, right? Because like a lot of people don't really want, do a lot of people not really want the realness of somebody? There's a lot of work that has to happen, I guess, to be real in a way that is also awake. Well, like that's that. really well said. <clears throat> I mean, you just said a, a whole lot of really important things. It's really true. When you're really genuine with someone, and it doesn't mean that, you know, you're that you're being obnoxious or you're being unpleasant, but you're just not hiding. Mm -hmm. I think my experience is other people feel often feel very threatened by that because they want you to play their game. And when you don't play their game, they get they get very, very, what the word is, threatened, you know, I don't like it. But some people do like it. And in a way, it's really interesting. As a teacher, what I've learned over the years is the more genuine I am, then I attract the right people and the people who really want to make this journey. Because otherwise, you, when I was a university teacher, I had a lot of people in my classes who were, you know, they like certain things. And they claimed they wanted to really learn more, but they didn't really. And 
it was a problem because then you wind up with a lot of people who want you to be different. They're always trying to get you to do things differently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, that says a lot too, just for people that there's sometimes this notion of wanting more, wanting more connection, wanting more versus wanting the right, like wanting it to be authentic and, and, and meaningful and aligned. And I've also, I think, heard you say, which I really appreciate. I'm kind of going through some things that I feel like I'm thinking of a listener that's suffering through some really basic human nature things. And you've just said some points around Tantra that I think are so supportive. Like yeah. I remember you saying something, how the greater your suffering is, the greater possibility for realization. And I wanted yeah. to see if you would elaborate on that, because that's really relieving to hear, because many of us feel like, oh, if I'm so challenged by life, like, how is it even possible for me to awaken? I'm so far you know, in a sense. Well, you know, the view of Vajrayana is that the universe is a, a sacred totality. It's a living, sacred organism, really. And everything that happens is part of the sacredness of what is. And, you know, as we say, the universe doesn't make mistakes. You know, the way the universe forms acorns, produces incredible oak trees, and the way the universe produces us and sets us here, you know, creates what we were meant to be, which is fully realized, free, fulfilled, joyful people. So suffering, I mean, it's very interesting. It's kind of going back to what we were just talking about. Suffering means that what's happening in our life doesn't align with what we think or what we expect or what we assume is supposed to be happening. And all those assumptions, you know, all of those belief systems that we have are the problem. And if you're lucky, the universe basically calls into question your belief system. And when we have a big event, you know, a big suffering, a big emotional upheaval, even, you know, we have a psychotic break, that's all fundamentally calling into question what we think and how we're going about things. And in our tradition, that is a, the most sacred moment of our life is when completely unfathomable and unbelievable suffering arises in our life. That That's the most sacred moment. And I'll be honest with you, I those are the people I want to work with. You know, people that are cruising, people that have it together, they're really not very interesting from a spiritual standpoint. And I, you know, I have students like that. And, I, and you know, truthfully, I'm, I'm just waiting for something to, to interrupt their dream. And then we can start working together. We can do some really good work. So basically, you know, that's why meditation is very important because the more you sit and the more you practice in the traditional somatic way of Buddhism, which means you're fully inhabiting your experience because experience arises in the body. It doesn't arise in the thinking mind. The more you're inhabiting your experience, the more stable you become. And the more stable you are, the more you can open to even the most unbelievable suffering. And, you know, you know, I, I find it really quite wonderful. Experienced practitioners, like in my case, I may wake up at night. And the more you practice, the more your emotional range increases, the more you're able to feel, not just of your own life, but of other people's lives. And so that's a gift. And when I wake up at night, sometimes I'm, I might be in a hell realm. And it's an incredible opportunity. And I, I go into it, I merge into it, I go into it. And it's a dark path. Or maybe I'm depressed. I don't really 
I don't necessarily get depressed anymore, but I used to. And to enter into the depression and want and see it as a sacred walkway and a passage from where I am to where I need to be. When I was in my late teens, I went to India. When I was around 19 or 20, I went to India. And I was a very, I would say, sheltered, culturally a very sheltered person. And I was gone for a year. And when I came back, I was literally suicidally depressed, really depressed. I mean, unbelievable darkness, blackness. And I thought at that point I would never have a life. And the only solace I had was I, that I could kill myself. And I was in that state for seven years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I met a therapist and refused to put me on medication and said, this is a spiritual crisis. You have to let go of your old self. And that your depression is like an acid bath that is eating away at your current sense of self, your current ego. And she hung in there with me. And it was the most incredibly, I mean, it changed my whole life. And I emerged from that. And you just don't look back. You know, you spend eight years, seven years thinking you'll never have a life. And all the inspiration that you have toward being alive, caring for people, you know, doing something you know, productive in the world, all of those run whole year after year after year. So, you know, by surrendering and giving in to what's holding us up, then, you know, when we come out the other end, I mean, n- nothing can stop us at that point. Mm. So depression, I mean, just as one example, but it could be serious illness, it could be the breakup of a relationship, could be anything. These are the most sacred moments in our life. And the most sacred moment in terms of my working with people is when people are dying, then they're the most open often. If they're practitioners, they are right there. And we can look into the deepest reality in them, which is truly infinite. So the universe doesn't make mistakes and what happens is sacred. And the Vajrayana means you open, you give in, you surrender to it. And you see what happens. Yeah, it's so powerful. And I it's really like the the opposite of the modern day, which is Uh, mm -hmm. which is control, no, the idea of descending into darkness or or letting the journey take you versus I'm gonna control this journey. Yeah wondering because you're somebody that's really given yourself to practice in the midst of the push of of modern day living and and also actually just a another aspect of that that i'm hearing as well through meditation and through this process you're also opening beyond human in in this way you're opening to the infinite which is not just human which is once again so much what the modern is human centric about us and so there's like these many aspects of what descending into darkness, descending into the infinite, is your experience people karmically become ready to give themselves over? Or what is that process of basically going against the stream of the modern pace, right? And, and the modern direction? Well, I think there's a sense in some people from childhood, I think, I mean, there's an inborn sense that's really quite common of, of people looking at the world and, you know, looking at how people do things, looking at what their parents say, looking at their peer group. On one hand, they're part of it, you know, and they have friends and, you know, they love their parents, whatever. On the other hand, there's something isn't right. You know, there's a, a sort of instinct of like, you know, this has got to be, this is can't be the whole picture. Mm-hmm. And... The, you know, from that point of view, they will often get attracted to some spiritual tradition. And when it's Buddhism, I would say there's a, a big difference between finding things in Buddhism that help you. And, you know, many people do that, even if it's just like, you know, 10 minutes of meditation at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. 
So that's that's one that's sort of the entry point. You know, there's something there that you know is obviously not quite this modern thing or whatever you want to call it. You know, the the conventional thinking of right now, and they're attracted to it, and they will connect. You know, in some way, relaxation, or maybe they go, you're a Buddhist teacher, or they read a book. That's great. But then, for some people, they 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 do that for a while, and they realize there's actually a tremendous amount of depth there. And I think, for many people, more and more people now, I think than ever before. Even you know, I I taught my first class, like believe it or not, fifty three years ago, and today more than ever, people. Feel there's something in themselves they have to give birth to that is not just more money or more status. There's something very deep that is calling them, calling them. And so many people say to me, "You know, I need to find out who I am." And what they mean is really find out, not just come up with some new idea, but actually discover who I am. And that you know that's a wonderful thing. And at that point, people will kind of sign on. You know, they'll sign on to working on themselves in in a long term way, not just resolving immediate issues. Yeah. And you know, and and really, I'll be honest, it's helped if something catastrophic happens in your life. That that will help you a lot. It's like a booster rocket, frankly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've noticed definitely the longer I'm on the Dharma path, the more catastrophic things happen in a way. It's like the thing that the only thing you don't want to happen happens, you know, <laughs> something like no, it's that. Very, you know? it's, very, it's very, very true. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, to me, that's the sign of a true practitioner that all of a sudden your life goes to hell in a handcart. And but the thing is, you, you, I mean, if you invite reality into your life, which most people do not do, I mean, their whole thing is like, keep it at bay. But if you invite reality into your life, reality is going to show up. And the way it shows up is, once again, your limited, small ego self begins to come unglued. Now, a lot of people think, well, without my ego, you know, I'm nothing. And that's true. In one way, you are nothing. But the thing is, when you are nothing, then you are free. You're free to experience everything in your life. You're free to love other people without being self-centered about it. And you're free to rejoice in everything that happens to you. So you become nothing, but then you become everything. By by being nothing, you're everything. But a lot of people can't get over that nothing part. You know, they really, they do not want to let go. I'm hanging on to what I've got. It may be little and really pitiful, but I'm not going to let go. <laughs> yeah, I and I'm, well, I have so many questions here I haven't even touched on, but I'm liking where you're bringing, <laughs> where you're bringing this and what is that piece? What is it about the letting go of even the pitiful little threads we're holding on to that we resist so much? What is our fear? Or what's underneath that? Well, I think, you know, you look at the, the whole mammal kingdom. In fact, you look all of life, but especially the, the animal kingdom. There's a sense of vulnerability. There's a sense, there's a fear of death. There's a fear of not having enough to eat. There's a tremendous amount of fear around survival. And in the human species, and this is also true of primates, part of our survival involves having a concept of ourself that even though our concept of ourself or our ego is constantly changing, we relate to it as if it's some kind of solid fortress that we can live inside. This is me, and I'm going to defend it, you know, and I'm going to build up those walls, and, you know, I'm going to be powerful. And uh, we don't want to lose that. The problem is who we fundamentally are is in process. Everything is changing. Everything's impermanent. There is nothing, actually. 
when we look deeply into it, which is what meditation, you know, helps you do, you realize there isn't anything there to hang on to. I mean, it's really groundless, this human thing. But there's so much fear around recognizing that and seeing it. And I think that's true in all cultures. You know, as a historian of religion, that's a problem all humans face. Most cultures have ways of reconnecting people with the infinite sacred flow of life and of the universe. Modern culture doesn't. We're, as you said, you know, we're going in the opposite direction. Yeah, that's really interesting. I want to talk about your somatic meditation. And actually, it kind of ties into what you're speaking of in terms of the, the holding on and mm -hmm. our resistance. You talk about how in somatic meditation or meditation around the subtle body, which you're very well known for, that we reach this place of tension. And a huge part of the practice is, is starting to unravel from that tension. What happens when we go into the tension and we start to release it like what 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 places do we access obviously it's good for our health i'm sure but beyond that why is that so significant in terms of our awakenment or realization well, it goes all the way down to the cellular level in other words the tightness and the tension can be measured even in terms of cells and their ability to oxygenate and to receive nourishment and to be able to transmit neurological information freely. So we, we are in a state of complete and total tension at all times. The problem with tension is that the more tense we are, the more our experience is shut down. There's, there's a direct correlation between tension and really being shut off from our own human experience. So, I mean, there's a lot to be said about it. For example, when the, the left brain, which is the connected, is the center of the ego, the left cerebral cortex, is very, very dominant in a person, means that we live in a purely conceptual world, a world of beliefs, a world of the internet, a world of disembodied being, then the body itself becomes way, way, way more tense. The thinking mind actually shuts off experience so that it can operate without being interrupted by actual experiential data. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to relax our body, all of a sudden our experience starts opening up. And human experience, you know, I'm going to just, you know, sort of jump ahead, but human experience, when we receive it without filters, without repression, without, you know, blocking it off, human experience disconfirms our beliefs about reality you know, our left brain beliefs. We talk about the body, but actually, when we talk about somatic meditation, we're talking about everything that in neurobiology is called subcortical. It's everything that's happening underneath our thinking mind. That includes the right brain. It includes the amygdala. It includes the brain stem. It includes, you know, our heart. That there's a whole knowing system in the heart and the gut and all the way down to our cells. There's, you know, the body actually, it, speaking in this way, everything but the thinking mind, it actually is in touch with the totality of the universe and knows it. And we begin to open up to that. And we begin to, but it, but we, it goes along with relaxation. So we use, as you know, we use, it's like breathing into the heart, breathing into the lower belly, breathing into the feet, bringing with the breath goes awareness always. So we're bringing awareness into our body. And all of a sudden, the thinking mind goes silent. Over time, it goes silent. And then your experience, you're living in your own human experience. And for most of us, that's really what we long for more than anything. I just want to experience my life, you know. And it's deeper than our fear, which is beautiful.
So it's in the relaxation that we actually are able to access the other aspects of knowing in our in our being. Exactly. Yeah. So even though our body holds wisdom and you've done such, you know, deep investigations on the body, I know the body also holds memories and, and uns- unsupportive habits. And sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, I'm just going to follow what my body says, you know, tells me to do. And then we do something that's probably not good for us sometimes as well. And I'm wondering from your exploration of the body, do you notice ways to differentiate the wisdom body from, you know, the, the habit body as you kind of go into these more subtle layers? Are there certain consistent factors you've noticed or consistent signals you've noticed when you're like, oh, I'm in the wisdom body, I'm in the more infinite true state versus more of the habit body? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really great question. The um, I wouldn't say the body holds like holds trauma. I would say that the thinking mind refuses to accept the information the body would like to offer up. If, if you know the, you've heard of Peter Levine, probably, who does, you know, he works with the body, works with experience. And the minute you start to pay attention to your body and you soften the the sort of, I would call it the fascism of the thinking mind, the control of the thinking mind, the minute you begin to relate to your body, that softens the ego mind. And all of a sudden, information comes through about trauma. So the body's not holding it. It's that the thinking mind is refusing to accept it. So here's an example. Let's take compulsive eating. So if you, we all have an eating disorder. I mean, this is one of my sort of, one of the things I find the most interesting. Everybody does. You watch people, the whole human race has an eating disorder, meaning that we use food not for nourishment and not for the health of our body alone, but we use it to allay anxiety and to act ourselves and to, you know, as a kind of space filler when we're we're feeling empty and alone and, you know, bored. So if you, let's say you have an eating disorder, that eating disorder is basically the way in which our thinking mind has found to deal with the problem of suffering, pain and suffering. You know, we all have addictions. We all have things we do when we begin to feel uncomfortable or threatened or we're in pain. And, it, you know, it's all over the place from toxic things like, you know, really harmful drugs and, you know, alcoholism, sexual addiction, work addiction. We all do it, you know, up and down the line. But in the case of eating disorder, if you, let's say you want to eat something and there's something really bothering you. And in my case, sometimes I will have a really, I would say, incredibly unfulfilling interaction with a student. Totally unfulfilling. And I feel empty inside. You know, my, my wife... Caroline uh, points this kind of thing out to me, and she and I, and I go, well, I'm going to have something to eat. And she goes, why? Are you actually hungry? And yes, I am hungry, but it's not physical hunger. So then I kind of sit down, and I really, I look into my body, I feel into my body, does my body actually want this, let's say, piece of cake? And amazingly enough, my body was saying no uh, i don't want that but that's true with all of our addictions if we actually feel into the body rather than having a lot of ideas about it and what's going to make us feel better the information is right there it's not a big deal and this goes for everything in life you know the body is or, or i'd say the somatic being which includes the right brain which is the the holistic knower, you know, in our consciousness. If we actually tune into that, everything in our life becomes amazingly straightforward and simple. You know, you don't under-exercise, you don't over-exercise. You 
You don't undereat, you don't overeat. You don't underwork, you don't overwork. There's a kind of natural balance when we're grounded in our body. And mind you, the body, you know, we have terms, other terms for soma. For example, people will talk about intuition. Well, that's a knowledge of the body. That's the subcortical knowledge. Or sometimes people talk about awakened instinct. And that's the knowledge of the subcortical body. So we have ways, but for some reason, because of our, you know, heritage, and it's mainly the Christian side, unfortunately, there's this assumption that spirituality and the body are different. So people sometimes really have a hard time with that. Like, how can I trust my body? Well, if you actually feel what your body's actually saying, you can, you can trust it. But most of the time we don't know, right? Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that breakdown. And in terms of soma and time, I also know time is a big stress factor for many people. It's like, you know, feeling bound in a 24-hour day, feeling bound by life and death, or just feeling like there's an edge always. And we're like trying to get there and kind of tying also from an earlier moment of our conversation of the surrendering to the to the journey. It feels like time is really impacted by being immersed in our soma and being really more of like a servant to our soma versus like trying to avoid it. And and I'm wondering any of your thoughts on time over time, like if it's changed the way you relate to the perceived pressure of these limits of how much time we have, you know, the to-do lists, all of that. If that I'm not sure if that question makes sense, but. Oh, <laughs> it makes so, so sense. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I think we have to look into it. You know, each one of us has to look into the way we handle time. Mm. So that's the first step. It's really being realistic about what we're actually doing. And one of the initial discoveries, I think, for people today is the amount of time, you know, no matter how pressured we are, the amount of time we actually waste doing things that aren't important. And I think, you know, for a meditator, you set aside time and you're going to have to look at your schedule. Because most people, if you say to people, it really, as, as was said to me, you know, 52 years ago when I met Torvi and Trungpa, well, you know, how much time should I spend meditating? And the response was, mm, an hour a day would help you, would be good. I mean, and then your meditation will evolve. And you should also, you know, plan to spend half a day on the weekends just meditating. And, and then, you know, things will go well. And um, most of us, like you think about that, and it's like, well, I don't have an hour a day. And I certainly don't have, uh, you know, three or four hours on the weekend. That's what we think. So the first step is actually, if you're if you're meditating, you really have to look into it and see. And one of the things that I've discovered is how much time I spent either procrastinating from doing something I needed to do, or trying to distract myself with things that are absolutely not essential to my life. So, in order, the first step in working with time. I think is just being really honest with yourself and going through your life. If this is important to you, you know, if time really is a problem for you, then looking at your life with a magnifying glass and looking at everything and beginning to simplify your life. So that's step number one. And then the second thing is to ask yourself emotionally, what are we getting out of what we're doing? What are we getting out of it? And we have all kinds of rationalizations, especially where well, other people may need me and this person needs me and that person needs me. Maybe not. I mean, our kids, absolutely, our kids need us. But do they need us in the way that we're carrying on? And do they need as much of us as we're, we think we want to give them? What about our friends? What about our relationships? So being honest about our own attempt to fill our emptiness by our all of the relationships that we have and to if you take that off the table then you relate to people in terms of what they need rather than what you need 
And then the third thing is, I mean, you, you asked the question, so I'm giving you the so-called three on answer. <laughs> At the Vajrayana level, you realize that the more you're actually living fully and completely present in this moment, and that takes a lot of work. It's not, you can't just tell yourself, I'm going to live in the now. You know, that doesn't work. But the more you are present to your own life, the more you realize that there is no time problem whatsoever, that things come to you when they need to, and you take care of them, and then you go to the next thing, and it's like a, a river, a beautiful river flowing through your life, which is all the things you have to relate to. And because you've connected with this sort of infinite part of yourself, there's nothing at stake for you in terms of your own personal fulfillment, nothing at stake. And so you can surrender to what time wants and what time is calling you to do. And then you see time is actually the sacred container through which I can achieve joy and freedom. And time is no problem at all. Time is beautiful. But, you know, the whole thing is it takes, you have to practice, you have to meditate and you've got to commit to it, and you've got to have some discipline about it. And, and this is difficult, you know, for people who are teaching spirituality and meditation, because we live in a world where people often are not familiar with the notion of the importance of, like, setting your direction, which is what discipline is. You know, you have a direction, and you kind of stay on course. That's all discipline is. You just stay on course. And a lot of people allow themselves to be batted around by relationships and, you know, people demanding things and the internet and this, that, and the other thing and the expectations of other people about how you should live. So being a, you know, truly spiritual person and working on yourself in depth requires, you know, a lot of courage. Don't you think? I totally agree. <laughs> Completely. You have to choose for yourself you have to decide what's really valuable to you and make your life show that like through what you actually do not what you say and and okay. that bit that you said about Chogyam Trungpa suggesting an hour of meditation once a day and then half a day on the weekend have you mm -hmm. found over time as well a ratio of the minimum for maintaining and ideally what you would do to improve your practice over time on a daily basis has it has it just remained at, at that hour or have you noticed anything else well we live in a different time you know when i was first studying with him it was a different world and it wasn't so pressured so i have a, a little bit of a different point of view now i think that the first thing is to meditate every day and do it at the same time and to decide on a period of time that where you can do that and if it's five minutes i'm okay with that the first thing we have to do is get used to the fact of meditating every morning or every whenever you do it the morning is the best time because at least i find once the day cranks up it's very hard to get to it you know yeah. even if i set aside a half an hour after a meeting it's not going to happen. So set aside, should be the same time every day, do it every day. Maybe you can, you know, skip one day if you're like traveling or something, that's fine. But, but get in the habit of it and start with whatever you can. And then add, you know, every week or two, add five minutes. And then eventually you will get to the point and, and it doesn't take forever where that, let's say you get up to 40 minutes, that 40 minutes becomes the most interesting time of your whole life. And the most productive, strangely enough, because your mind kind of untangles itself. And even if you're not thinking about your day, you get up from your practice, and all of a sudden, your day is kind of clear, you know? Now, in my case, I had to meditate just because I'm, I'm a hard case. I've always been a hard case. And 
These days, I sit usually two hours in the morning when I wake up. And I can't even tell you how important that time is and how beautiful it is. And I'm, I get about twice as much done of actually productive work being, uh, you know, somewhat of a workaholic. I still haven't kicked that one yet. Twice as much done as when I don't meditate, because sometimes I can't, you know, I sit super, super late and I have an early meeting. Um, day usually is kind of, ugh, you know, it's not joyful. So practice in the beginning, be realistic. But the most important thing is a discipline. Whatever you commit to, do it. But don't, you know, don't sign up for something you can't do. You know, don't be unrealistic. It's much more important to succeed at something really small in the beginning than to, you know, overcommit. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And do you find in terms of retreat periods, I know for you, you used to do a month of dark retreat a year. You had these kind of intense periods of, of retreat. Do you find it significant, again, for someone that wants to progress on their path that they go into a certain amount of continuous retreat, right? Rather than parts of the day. And and what, what do you recommend? I know this is very hard because this is, you know, to a whole audience of people in very different places, you know, but I feel like this is your place, right? Practice Practice is your essence of offering. So I trust you. I trust you something to, to share in this realm. <laughs> well, long, long retreats. This is quite interesting. We'll start at one end of the spectrum. In the Tibetan tradition, if people are really serious, they will do three-year retreats. <clears throat> and Trimbrimshi did not advise that because... I mean, we don't need to go into it, but when when there's retreats are too long, they become too comfortable. And his whole thing was we're constantly wanting to to disrupt our expectations and dismantle our, you know, our constant trying to build this ego thing. So on the other hand, <clears throat> periods of retreat are unbelievably transformative if you if you do a week <clears throat> i have a friend that does <clears throat> excuse me he does two weeks twice a year he's very you know he works he's in the corporate world and that's all he can really get i mean these are amazingly impactful on him that's not a lot of retreat time you know two weeks twice a year even one week you know at in and the first you know a few years you're meditating, <clears throat> you know, it can do the work of six months of daily practice. <clears throat> it can be so fulfilling because you meet yourself in, in a much more complete way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very much in favor of if people can set the time aside. At the same time, I would say always be driven by your fundamental longing. <clears throat> if, you, if you're meditating, you have a longing just to kind of let it go you know, put aside your cell phone, put aside your computer, put aside all the meetings. And I advise people actually to go into retreat, you know, with nothing. You know, don't take anything with you. Take one inspirational book, but don't do anything. Just sit and find out who you are when you don't have all this whole world of entertainment and distraction and work. Who are you? You know, who are you? That's what this is about. And when you find out who you really are, it doesn't matter how hard it's been. It is so worth it because you realize for the first time, I know why I'm alive. I'm alive just to be, to be here, to be in this life I have. But until you discover it for yourself, it's always a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Well, since this is called Love and Liberation, the, the podcast, I, I feel inclined also to ask you just about relationship and and how you've noticed that meditation has impacted your relationships and the capacity to do relationship in, in a more compassionate or, or connected way. <laughs> or whatever, whatever is true for you in, in that realm. Well, the, the whole Vajrana tradition is a tradition about relationship. That's what it's about. It's about the other, <clears throat> the sacred other. And 
the sacred other is your partner, it's your children, it's your parents, it's your close friends, it's all people. And it's also the animal kingdom. It's also everything that's alive, that lives. It's the so-called inanimate world, the mountains and the rivers. It's the whole universe. The Vajrayana is about opening in, we could, we could say, authentic relationship with the other. And where this really lands most powerfully is in your intimate relationships. And my, <clears throat> my wife and I, I don't know how to put it, we had a really interesting conversation last night. We're watching a, a Netflix series about psychedelics. And one of the sessions is on MDMA and, you know, ecstasy. And these couples were talking about how it really opened them up and helped them learn how to communicate with each other. And they're, you know, and find a way to deal with problems they couldn't, they didn't know how to deal with. And this woman, you know, that I've been with for quite some time, world's most honest individual, never plays any games. And so I thought it'd be interesting. I said, do you think we need to do that as a couple? She looked at me and she said, no. And I think what she was getting at is when you meditate as a couple, you know, when both people are working on themselves, the relationship becomes one of the most powerful crucibles for seeing one's own belief systems and realizing how much we hold on to our own point of view and our own ego. And, you know, with her, as time has gone by, I've known her, I guess we've been together about 17 years. And, I mean, I know this is going to sound weird, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. I never know who she is. And whatever I think, she's she has a different point of view. Now, you can say, well, that's obvious. But the thing is, it comes up all the time. It's like a constant mirror. And I constantly have to let go of what I think, what I think she thinks, what I think she feels, what I think she thinks about me, what what I think she thinks about anything. And it's it's very powerful. We're doing, Caroline and I are doing a concert weekend, mm -hmm. an online weekend in October. I, I can't really remember when it is. I think it might be a little bit toward the end. I don't know. And it's, you know, because people need encouragement to, and, and some tools, you know, how to, 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 I would say, use their intimate relationship as a vehicle of self-knowledge, self-transformation. And ultimately, I think the outcome in the Vajrayana is that you love the other person time out of mind, not because they're like you and not because you understand them, but because they're not like you and because you don't understand them. I used to say that love isn't just a feeling, you know, love is really hard work. But now what I think is love is a feeling. <laughs> and and uh, the feeling is an intense sense of love, passion, connection, longing all the time. And you have to take yourself out of it because people, I mean, when you fall in love, you do, you glimpse it and it makes you crazy. And you have to take yourself out and you have to live with the fact that you're never going to actually, and I'm speaking as a man now, you're never going to possess that other person. You're never going to, you can't, there's nothing you can control here. You can only let go. And when you let go, that's when love really is born. So it's a very, it's a spectacular tradition 
you know, this whole thing about relationality. And again, working with the body is, is the path because, you know, our intuition always tells us how it is with other people. You can't think your way through a relationship. You know, you have to, it's, it's not just feeling either, it's intuition. It's sort of that direct, naked perception of who the other person is and what they're trying to communicate. So it's, it, we live in a very tricky world because there's so many, there's so much, so many opinions about relationships and about, especially the whole identity politics thing. You know, there are people that you're authorized to like and people you're authorized to hate. And it's just very confusing for everybody now. But our in our tradition, every single human being deserves fundamental respect and an acknowledgement of the sacredness of who they are. And that has to be the ground of the whole thing. But I'm telling you, it's a hard sell, right? Today. It is a hard sell. And I'm wondering moment by moment what it is to inhabit that that freshness or the intuitive relationship for you. Like, what is that like as you're moving through your day, cohabitating with your wife? I can't wait to see her. I mean, it's really weird. You know, I can't, my favorite time, I was telling her last night, my favorite time is when we get in bed together at night favorite time of the whole day and then during the night I can't wait to see her in the morning I mean it's really I know it sounds weird but the thing is she will tell you and I will tell you this has been a really hard relationship and when we I was married to someone else and it, it just really you know the karma was done it happens and I met her and neither one of us wanted to be together because we're completely different we come you know she comes from a corporate world she was you know she was an executive in her 20s with coca-cola asia and grew up in you know she's american but she spent 25 years in china you know i'm in like an academic so like completely different people but the thing was when we got together the light of reality burn bright and neither of us could stand it. Mm -hmm. And I spent the first three or four years just like, I've got to get away from, I got to get out. And she confessed later, she said the same, she was saying that to herself. How am I going to get away from this person? I don't even like him. I mean, you know, I, I like his teaching, but I don't like him. And I was meantime, crazy, crazy in love with her for no reason whatsoever. So it was, I, I want to emphasize that it was really, really, really hard. And the Dharma gave us tools to work through it. But now it's like, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's really joyful. It's, it's the most wonderful thing in my life. And I think every day, if I ever lose her, that's it. I'm just going to, I'll just drop dead. I will, because she's so important to me. Hmm. So the Dharma tools that you use, you said, oh, we know we've worked through it. It's one of the hardest relationships. It's been very hard and we've used some Dharma tools to work through it. Are there any Dharma tools you can articulate thinking of a listener that's, you know, in a relationship that, that feels right, but is so challenging? <laughs> <laughs> you ask, you're asking really great questions. Number one is don't believe what you think about the other person, don't believe it. And number two is, do not run away. Whatever is happening, do not run away. I mean, these have been my mantras. Don't believe what you think, don't believe your judgments, which are gonna come up. And number two, don't run away. Stay home in your body, stay home in your person. Don't give yourself away, don't give your power to the other person. Stay home, stay rooted, stay grounded. And I think, you know, often we've had a, a wonderful Hakomi couples therapist who, you know, Hakomi is very somatic. And so it was, it was really helpful for us. And her thing was, you know, when things get too intense, don't run away, but take, take a step back. And, you know, either person can call time out. And then, you know, like she used to say to me, I don't want to talk to you the rest of the day. I want, I have some stuff to work through. It's not like I'm a bad, she's not saying I'm a bad person. She said, I have some stuff to work through. 
you know, leave, stay away, don't talk to me, and, and let's check in tomorrow morning. So that's very important too. It, it, you know, not running away means you just don't split. You know, you you separate by mutual agreement to work on yourselves. So I don't know, those would be... Yeah, it's really helpful. I really, yeah, I like all the, the facets. I'm sure people can relate to the, you know, the tendency to just run, to bolt the moment it gets hard and to know that pattern within them. And then the piece of staying within the body, it's such a huge deal to yeah. stay here. And then, yeah, that last piece also feels really helpful. It just It also feels helpful because you're telling the person that you're not you are going to return. There's something really important for that as well. Like I am circling back and this is what I need and, and exactly. honoring that need. Yeah. Exactly. Is there anything else you want to share? Anything that feels current? I know you're working on a book. I, I'm really enjoying you so much. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm finishing a book. Um, it's called Meeting Chogyam Trungpa. And it's it's really about, you know, a long time ago, but what it was like meeting this very, very unusual teacher. And the reason, one of my main motivations for writing it is that I don't think, especially these days, people really, you know, they think, well, he was a Tibetan teacher, he was outrageous, he did a lot of things that people didn't understand. You know, he... He was just, a, you know, from some people's point of view, a bizarre individual. I mean, I will say he operated outside of the box. He, he lived his whole life outside the box. He just didn't go out periodically. But at the same time, they kind of lump him in with all the Tibetan teachers and Tibetan Buddhism and people, you know. They don't realize that the Dharma that he taught and the way he taught is very, very unusual. And... Obviously, over my life, I've met and, you know, been friends with, you know, a lot of the Tibetan teachers and some of the current ones that are very popular. And nobody, nobody really gets what he was actually doing, you know, the full depth of what he was teaching, which makes me very sad. I mean, people quote him, you know, a lot of the younger tokus quote him a lot, but it's they're not doing it and so i felt i needed to you know before i finished writing books i needed to write a book to show not you know not kind of lecture at people but just in my own experience what made him so very unusual and how he took somebody like me that was about as messed up as anybody you'll ever meet and about as disembodied as anybody you'll ever meet and actually created a path for me that became quite meaningful 